Lockheed Constellation, nicknamed the Connie, was often described as the queen of the skies. She was one of the most advanced airliners of her time. The elegant curves of her design gave the plane a look of distinctive grace and subtle refinement. The Constellation was the ultimate of piston engine airliners and broke new ground for both commercial and military aircraft. Lockheed, going back to 1912, had built a reputation for constructing dependable and comfortable planes. They also became associated with the legendary names of aviation, such as Wiley Post and Amelia Earhart. Lockheed also retained the services of two men who comprised perhaps the greatest engineering team in history. They were Paul Hubbard and Kelly Johnson. The company produced a large family of fast twin engine transports. The Electra and the Lodestar carry between 10 to 18 passengers in relative comfort. After the 21-passenger Douglas DC-3 appeared in 1935, Lockheed decided to introduce the Model 14 Super Electra. This was a 14-passenger twin-engine design that was larger and more powerful than the previous Electra. In 1938, millionaire Howard Hughes piloted a Super Electra around the world with an expert crew in three days and 19 hours. This record stood for many years. Hughes would later turn to Lockheed to fulfill his own aviation ambitions. Lockheed delivered 112 Model 14s and an additional 119 were built under license in Japan. Although the Super Elector was faster than the DC-3, it was smaller and not truly competitive. Pre-war and post-war DC-3s dominated the twin-engine transport market, and after the war ended, the Model 14 was no longer part of the airline scene. The Model 14 was followed by yet another, the Lockheed Model 18 Lodestar. It used Electra wings and tail on a stretched fuselage that could accommodate 15 to 18 passengers. But even with its larger size, the Lodestar was still no match for the DC-3. Pictured here is a stunning Model 18 Lodestar with a Howard 250T conversion which transforms it into a tricycle gear aircraft. The sleek extended nose is needed to house the retractable forward landing gear. Only four of these conversions were performed on the Model 18 and only two survived. This Lodestar is also fitted with a plush executive style interior.
It soon could be realized that individual planes would need to carry many more people over much greater distances. Lockheed, already working towards this goal, had designed the model 44 Excalibur, which was capable of carrying 36 passengers. When Howard Hughes approached them on behalf of his struggling airline, TWA, he knew what sort of plane he wanted. His specification was for an aircraft that could carry a payload of 6,000 pounds from New York to LA, nonstop in eight to nine hours. He imagined a four-engine pressurized airliner cruising at over 300 miles per hour. Hughes' opportunity to be involved with TWA came about when Boeing failed to meet the delivery requirements of TWA's order for five Model 307 Stratoliners. TWA needed money and ideas when Howard Hughes was contacted. Hughes laid down his condition on the project. Secrecy. Only a few people would work on the project, and anything written on paper was personally destroyed by Hughes himself. All of those involved were afraid to say anything for fear that scraps of information could be pieced together and the new design would be discovered. When the Lockheed design was presented to Hughes, he liked it and ordered 40 of the constellations, designated the Model 49, which would be purchased by the Hughes Tool Company. This was done to prevent disclosure requirements. Another stipulation by Hughes was that Lockheed could not sell the Connie to any other airline until 35 had been delivered to him. This would give TWA over two years with the world's fastest commercial airliner. It was to the company's advantage that they had never before built a large passenger aircraft. Lockheed's engineers would start from scratch, resulting with the unusual looking but well-designed Connie. With their large engines turning at low RPMs, they were less likely to feel stress and to break down. Hence, a combination of these engines with large propellers were used. These large propellers required considerable ground clearance and an extended nose gear to shorten the forward wheel strut, so the nose was bent downward. The area of disturbance caused by the propellers meant a triple tail wouldn't work in flight. However, a more efficient single tail wouldn't fit in the hangar. So the fuselage was curved upwards so the triple tail was placed away from the propeller turbulence. The first constellation did not go to TWA, but to the U.S. Army Air Force. The secret design was revealed with the outbreak of World War II. When the War Production Board made visits to various manufacturers, they were very surprised, to say the least, when they saw the Connie. It was obviously a plane ahead of its time. The Army Air Force was so impressed with the plane that they ordered 40 constellations, which they designated the C-69, and increased the order to 260. At war's end, they took delivery of only 22 aircraft. Due to the war, Lockheed was unable to manufacture for the civilian market, and this hurt the plan that Howard Hughes has sought to save TWA. There were many questions at the war's end. What was the future of Lockheed and TWA? And what would the Army do with the C-69s? Many meetings were held regarding the future design updates for the Connies, which would compete with the Douglas DC-6. Also, newsreels and magazines were beginning to inform the public about this new Lockheed aircraft. The air transport of tomorrow becomes the reality of today. The Constellation, America's newest land-based cargo plane, is ready for her first flight.
Beneath her wings, a P-38 fighter plane looks like a toy miniature. Built to fly at 35,000 feet in the stratosphere, the big ship is said to be faster than a Jap Zero fighter plane. Four powerful engines lift the sky giant aloft. A plane that can cross the American continent or the Atlantic Ocean in eight hours with a full load. Forerunner of a mighty fleet. Lockheed felt it had to find some way to relax the agreement with Howard Hughes so they could sell to other airlines or would be lost in the competitive market. If they could produce an updated post-war model, they could grab the market's edge. But Howard Hughes would not budge from the original agreement. After failing to negotiate with him, Lockheed took on a disinterested attitude. Eventually, all was worked out and Hughes relented. Mr. Hughes was involved with the post-war Model 49, but didn't involve himself with the technical aspects of the Connie's negotiations. Hughes did fly the domestic inaugural flight of the Star of California on February 15, 1946, between Los Angeles and New York. The press compared his record-breaking time of 8 hours and 38 minutes to the competition's Douglas DC-4s. TWA was suddenly the leader. At the end of the war, Lockheed had orders for over 100 constellations from many airlines. Because of these contracts, Lockheed would keep its wartime skilled workforce. The plane soon reverted from its military designation to its Lockheed project number the Model 49. Meanwhile, the 73 constellations already in place, along with the recycled C-69s, gave Lockheed the time to update the plane before releasing the first advanced civilian model. The Model 649 first flew in October of 1946. It was a noticeable advance on the previous model, with more soundproofing and cabin air conditioning. Even as the 649s were being shipped to the airlines, another model, the 749, was being developed as a long-range overseas operation aircraft. It was closely based on the model 649. However, it had additional fuel tanks on the outer wings, which added 1,000 miles to the aircraft's range. The Constellation stood as the ultimate of all propeller-driven planes of this era. The technology of the propellers themselves was highly advanced. With its freely reversible blades, the Connie would rapidly decelerate on landing, and of course, the props could be fully feathered if an engine failure had occurred. Even if one engine had to be shut down, the Connie demanded so little of its engines during normal operations that under adverse conditions, the power use was practically unlimited. Some of the pilots called the Connie the best tri-motor aircraft ever built because the aircraft had so many engine failures. The military renewed its interest in the Constellation when the model 749 was released. The initial C-69 had numerous design problems, so the Army canceled many of its contracts. It already had its fleet of Douglas C-54s, which served them well. It wasn't until 1948 that there was a renewed interest by the military. By now, the problems with design had been overcome, and the Connie was a well-proven aircraft. The Air Force was now ready to order its own military version. 
These were designated the C-121A. Only 10 of these were ordered and they were designed for cargo and personnel loads. In 1950, the C-121As were returned to the factory for modifications, making them deluxe models. These became known as VIP aircraft. One was assigned to General Eisenhower, which he named Columbine, and the other to General Douglas MacArthur, which he named Patan. When Eisenhower became president, still another VIP model was assigned to him, which then became the Columbine II. By this time, the Navy's C-121s took on a new military role, and the Connies were now equipped with radar designated for special patrol assignments. This would dictate a new role of large military transport aircraft. It also led to a much more sophisticated VIP aircraft assigned to President Eisenhower named the Columbine III which served into the Kennedy administration. The Columbine's history is worth noting since it originated as the first C-69 and given the number 1961. It was this old 1961 that started with the Army and was refitted with Pratt & Whitney engines. After the war, it was put up for sale and bought by Howard Hughes, who in turn sold it back to Lockheed in 1949. Incredibly, it was the old 1961 that served as the prototype for the next Connie, the model 1049. It was called the Super Constellation and incorporated an 18 foot 4 and 3 quarter inch stretch of the standard Constellation fuselage for a total length of 113 feet 7 inches. TWA was involved in the development of this superplane from the start. However, Eastern Airlines had placed its order first, so they received the first of the Super Connies. In addition to lengthening the plane, it had a better de-icing system for the wings, increased fuel capacity and more powerful engines. Overall, a total of 550 design improvements went into the 1049. And while the gross takeoff weight of the plane had increased by only 12%, the design was so good that the payload increased by 40%. Seating was also increased and could now carry up to 109 passengers, depending on the layout chosen for each aircraft. The Connie again had proven its usefulness and cornered the market for Lockheed, which they intended to keep. Today, any modern army would be lost without the use of aerial command posts and radar stations. It comes as no surprise that these early tactics were carried out in the constellations. And when the Navy ordered the construction of its first airborne radar pickets, these were also Connie's 
which replaced earlier versions, carried aboard converted World War II bombers. It had a crew of 22, including radar operators, engineers, and flight crew. Soon, the Air Force followed suit. Between the Air Force and the Navy, over 25 different designations were used in identifying the various radar-equipped commies. As the Cold War escalated, it became all too important to have airborne surveillance capabilities. But the Connie's career was truly in question, since it was now painfully obvious that the introduction of jet transports would change the market. Lockheed was determined not to be left behind, so they decided to design the ultimate constellation, the model 1649A Starliner. Incorporating a new wing shape and numerous other major revisions, the Starliner was Lockheed's hope to dominate the long-range airliner market. But instead, the model 1649A sat in a yard, while orders for the Super Connie continued to come in. Although numerous improvements were made to the Starliner, making it unquestionably the best of the Connies, only 44 were built, and most of these phased out of service and replaced by the competition's new jetliners. TWA was the largest user of the Model 1649 by acquiring 29 of the aircraft. In order for the Starliner to be attractive to the Air Force, Lockheed had to invest a considerable amount of time and money. The revolving disc was only one of the systems developed for submission. Added to the Starliner, with its extended range, specialized layouts, and other special features, Lockheed was ready for the next sales opportunity. But the military's budget restraints forced the cancellation of the Armed Forces version of the Starliner. It was also a foregone conclusion that the aging C-121s would need to be replaced. When the competition was announced to replace the C-121s, Lockheed was fairly certain the Starliner didn't stand a chance. These fears were confirmed as the new specification requirements came to light. The Air Force was in the market for a jet-powered plane, and the Boeing Company was best suited to meet that need. It did so with a jet tanker developed for the Air Force called the KC-135. The Air Force and the Navy were content with the C-141A's track record, so they continued to use it, along with the new Boeing jet. The first U.S. C-141s based in the Asian theater arrived in the spring of 1965. Constellations flew throughout the Vietnam War, and their contribution was invaluable. Their main job was airborne early warning. Since they were fitted with sophisticated specialized electronics, they were used to relate the data transmitted from the many sensors scattered across the North Vietnamese supply routes. The cargo versions were used for medical evacuation and passenger planes. The Connies were to be the eyes in the sky, detecting North Vietnamese bombers attacking targets in the south. Although this didn't prove to be an intense need, there were additional duties which kept them active during the conflict. When air operations began over the north, the Connie's radar capabilities became essential. Now their role went from passive to active. On-duty MiGs were given information as to the location of American aircraft. This was countered with the use of American radar planes. Besides warning aircraft in the area to expect trouble, the radar planes could direct their attacks on enemy missiles and radar locations.
The last Constellation flights of the war were flown in May 1974. Over 25 years had passed since that first Connie had so impressed the Navy, and over 31 years had gone by since the very first Constellation flight. Just as it seemed that Connie could go on forever, the end came. The Connie was regarded as one of the most beautiful piston engine aircraft ever built. It was the beginning of dependable non-stop domestic and international air travel. The U.S. Armed Forces bought 331 of the 856 Connies manufactured during the production years 1942 to 1958, and the remaining were purchased by air carriers throughout the world. However, their career ended with the age of the jetliners. The Connies were forcibly retired long before they were worn out. Their career was over as a major passenger liner and U.S. Armed Forces plane. They were relegated to small passenger hops on lesser routes, and finally, as spray planes and cargo carriers. There are less than a handful flying Connies left in the United States. Some can be seen at flying exhibitions across the nation, such as at this recent air show featuring the Save a Connie Star of America, making spectacular low passes for the excited crowd at a popular Midwest show. Although progress continues in the field of aviation, the Connie will always be remembered as one of the most glamorous and beautiful aircraft ever built. Truly, the queen of the skies.